Praise Jesus. A very good evening to all of you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, good evening. Good evening. We, are, we are here to uh, learn from the Holy Spirit. We are in the school of the Holy Spirit and we are here to learn from the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit about the love of God. So I request uh, Sister Delecta, uh, would you like to say the opening prayer? Yes. Yeah, uh, Sister Salvi, Sister Salvina, whoever would like to start with the opening prayer can start. Miss Salvin, Miss Salvin, please unmute your mic. Yes, it is unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. yeah. Okay, okay. In the name of the Father and of the, and the Son and of the Holy, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we gather together today, we want to thank you for making it possible for each one of us to attend this session. Through this gathering, Lord, help us to grow closer as a fast week family and nurture the bonds of love among us. Send forth your Holy Spirit on this gathering. And Lord, those who will be sharing your word with us, bless them with your grace and wisdom. And those who will be receiving these teachings, prepare our hearts and minds and bless us with understanding that all that we do is for your greater glory. Amen. Amen. Glory be the Father and Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sister. Uh, so once again, a warm uh, welcome and a good evening to you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, it's always a joy to come back uh, here, uh, though we meet once in a, once in a month. Uh, I always look forward to the sessions. So today, uh, let us uh, study about uh, doing good. Uh, doing good to whom it is due. So Sister Fedora, can you take us to Mark chapter 3, verses 1 onwards? Thank you, Jesus. Mark 3, verses 1 Onwards. Praise God. Yeah, so uh, one of the sisters would like to read this. Praise God. A man with a withered hand. Again, he entered the synagogue and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, they watched him to see whether he could cure him on the day of the Sabbath so that they could accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, come forward. And he said to them, is it lawful to do good or do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired and with the Herodians against him. How to destroy him? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So, Sister, if we go back, back to the very first verse, we see that it is talking of Jesus entering the synagogue. And when Jesus entered and a man was there who had a withered hand. Now, he was there before Jesus entered. And uh, since he was there 
before Jesus entered, the Pharisees would have expected that some kind of um, action will happen over here and then they could trap Jesus. So uh, Mark 3 verses 2 tells us, they watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they could, they might accuse him. So they are already prepared. Their mindset is that of accusation and they are waiting to see how Jesus is going to respond. Now, at that time, uh, for them, on the day of the Sabbath, they were not expected to do um, any work. So when it was not expected to do any work, even if it was a healing, that was also considered as a work and which they did not really allow at that point in time. So they knew that Jesus would come. Thank you, Jesus. So, so since they had come, uh, they had come prepared that uh, Jesus would do something and they could accuse him. Um, they were waiting on when they were watching. Mark 3.3 3 tells us that, and he said to the men who had withered him, come forward. So we see here that Jesus is, is on a lookout um, how he can do good to others. It is not that uh, only if someone comes and asks him, it's not only when people come forward and, and uh, expect a healing, but when he sees that there is someone to whom good can be done, Jesus does it even without being asked, even without being told. Neither the men asked him, nor did any of the disciple come with that request. And yet um, he says, asks him to come forward. And uh, then he said to them, because Jesus was already aware of what was going on in their mind. He knew that uh, the, the thoughts that they were considering. And he said, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save life or to kill? But they were silent. And when they were silent, uh, it it um, he looked at them and uh, this look was with anger. Why did he look at them with anger? Because it grieved them. It grieved them at the hardness of their heart. Now, according to the law, uh, Sister Fedora, can we go to Exodus uh, 23 verses 5 and we'll come back here. Yeah, it, uh, only one script, one verse can be read, sister. Praise God. Exodus 23 verses 5. The sister who read sometime earlier, can you read please? Thank you, Jesus. When you see the donkey of the one who hates you lying under its burden and you would hold back from setting it free, you must help it help to set it free. Praise God. Now, if there is if there is any burden on an animal and um, it is it is expected that even if you, hate that person to whom this donkey belongs. In that case also, the person is expected to set that donkey free, to help. Now, this is just an animal who's going, carrying a burden. And, and at some other point in time, Jesus even asked them, if, if any of your um, oxen uh, falls into a, a pit, on a Sabbath, will you not rescue it? So when it when it comes to um, their own belongings, when it comes to their uh, cattle or their animals, even if it was a Sabbath, 
it was okay for them to do it what grieves what grieves jesus is because now this man is there in the synagogue he is there with a withered hand and when jesus asks them knowing what is going on the, on their mind none of them speak up for him none have compassion can we go back to mark 3 uh, Three five sister, one five. Praise God. So so he looked around and he was he was um angry because he was basically he was grieved. And what was the reason of him being grieved? It was at their hardness of heart that none of them had the heart to say, um you know, do good, heal him. rescue his 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 uh, him from the burden none of them felt that way rather they kept silent and and jesus even though he spoke that is it lawful to do he posed a question to them to which he did not get a response he did not need any of their permission he did not need the permission of the of the gathering to do good but knowing that what was going on in their mind he he puts this question and when all of them are um, were silent he he goes forward and he he tells the man stretch your hand and as he stretched it out and and his hand was restored so uh, my dear brothers and sisters we we need to understand that Jesus was here on this planet earth and he was here only to do good of course he he was here to give us our salvation to rescue us from being condemned to to bridge the gap the the separation that had happened between god and men due to the disobedience of adam jesus came to restore that friendship so that we could be adopted back into the family into the divine family into the kingdom of heaven jesus came on planet earth with that sole purpose and whilst he was here on his mission he went about doing good he went about healing <clears throat> all those who were oppressed of the devil acts 10 um sister can you look at acts 10 38 Thank you, Jesus. How, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were op oppressed. by the devil for god was with him praise jesus so we we see here that jesus who was um, anointed with the holy spirit and with power he went about doing good and that what he went about doing good and healing that healing he did for all it was irrespective of who the person was that means when good is to be done there is no there is no criteria jesus did not have any criteria that okay these people who come to the synagogue only will be healed these people who follow the law only those will be healed no jesus did not have any criteria for doing good and that is why the word of god tells us how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed because the the work of the enemy was is to bring about destruction bringing about sickness but jesus who was anointed with the holy spirit and with power he went about doing good now that good was unconditional it it did not it did not depend upon the the 
situation. It did not depend where that person belonged to. It did not depend uh, for a particular location. If we look at, uh, sister, can we go to Romans 13, 8? Thank you, Jesus. Owe oh, no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Praise God. So, so when we look at this, um, the word of God says um, that we are not to owe anyone anything, but we, we owe to everyone love. God has created, God, we, we know that God is love, and he has created us in love to love. Praise God. Just give me a second, please. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So, um, the, the word of God tells us that we are not to owe anybody anything, but it is there is an exception. And that exception is we are called to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. If we move to verses 10, Romans 13, 10, Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Praise God. So that here, here Jesus, um, the, the word of God uh, reveals here that love does no wrong to, the, to a neighbor. Mm -hmm. And when love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore, love is the fulfilling mm -hmm. of the law. Um, so when, when Jesus was there on planet Earth, there was this person who had come to him and he had come to him with a question of asking how he can get eternal life. And uh, when that question was asked, how he can get eternal life, um, sister, can we go to the, the Good Samaritan? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, couldn't re uh, recall that scripture, the Good Samaritan. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, sister. Please come. The, the, the Good Samaritan? Yes. Yeah. So, so we, we see here in, in the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan, we have this young, uh, this this lawyer, who stood. He stood because not because he wanted to know anything, but he stood up to test Jesus, because they were always looking for opportunities by which they could blame him, they could accuse him, and that is why he he asked Jesus, saying, "Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life?" And uh, uh, Jesus asks him about the law. And he responds speaking about loving loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, mind. And uh, he adds saying that um, you need to love your neighbor as well. So uh, Jesus said to him, you have already given the right answer. And he said, you, you do this and you have eternal life. You will live. But since, since that lawyer came to frame Jesus, he came to test, to put him to a test. He asks him, who is my neighbor? Now to this, to this, the, the Lord beautifully explains to him with a parable. Um, even before we get to the parable, I'll just like to share um, an experience that I had um, a few days back, we all of us know that uh, the Feast of the Nativity of Mama Mary uh, is celebrated on the 8th of uh, September. And uh, we had uh, novenas 
and our parish priest has assigned each of the catechism class for uh, conducting the novenas, like each day of the nine days were assigned to a catechism uh, class. Now, I finished mine. There was another a teacher for she needed to prepare because when the assignment is made you need to prepare the liturgy you need to write the liturgy then there are powerpoint presentations which are used with the hymns and the responses so this catechist being a working uh, lady a working young woman uh, she was unable to use the, the computer which is available at the parish because she was to do her assignment only after working hours so it would be like late evening and she gave me a call and um, she asked me if I could lend my laptop to her. I did in the past, but on that particular day when she asked me, the first thing when she asked me what crossed my mind was, uh, if I give my laptop to her, I have three back-to-back -back classes coming up in that week because on a Friday, I was to go to the school to teach uh, value education with the word of God. Uh, Saturday, I was to conduct the, along with the team, other team members. We were supposed to have a, a one-day retreat uh, for the higher secondary students at presentation convent. Then on the on Sunday, I was supposed to preach at Panino. So immediately what came to my mind was, I need my laptop because I need to prepare for all these classes. And I quickly told her, I'm, I'm so sorry, I need the laptop, I can't spare it. Uh, but like, you know, I was also quick to tell her that anytime in the future, if you need, then you can ask me and uh, I will give it to you. Don't hesitate for the next time. But this time I cannot give it. So that was my uh, immediate response. Because what was on my mind, on my mind, I had the classes that I had to prepare for, the notes that I needed to make. So her need was not a priority for me. Even though she 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 needed help, I had my own uh, justification why I couldn't give. And no matter how good the ex, uh, justification is, an excuse is always an excuse. So I just hung up the phone and within within a minute, I had this conviction, the uh, Holy Spirit uh, bringing to my remembrance the scripture, 1 John 3.17. We'll come back to this later, Sister Fedora. Uh, can we go to 1 John 3.17? Praise God. 1 John 3.17. Sister Anna. Thank you, Jesus. Sister, can I read? Yes, go ahead. Please, Sister. Can you hear me? How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help. Praise God. Now the Holy Spirit reminded me of this scripture at that time when I told that uh, catechist that I cannot give the laptop because I have work to do. It This scripture convicted me so much that the moment I was reminded of this, I did not delay. I called her back and I said, uh, I in fact told her, I gave her the scripture and I said, you know, uh, the Holy Spirit has convicted me with this scripture, 1 John 3, 17, that how does God's love abide in anyone who, who has the world's goods? Now, I have the good, the, the device, the laptop, and she is someone who was in need. At that point in time, even though I know that she has a need, what am I thinking? I'm thinking of my need four days hence, three days hence. But she needed something for the very next day. I had, for that time being, I had hardened my heart. I was not sensitive enough to her need. And that's the reason I declined it to her. But praise be to God, 
when we have the word of God deposited in our heart, when we, uh, when you fellowship with the word of God, the you meditate on the word of God. The Holy Spirit is is so good because He is our helper. He is our counselor. He is He is there to help us. That He reminded me about this uh, promise of God, and it convicted me. And I immediately called her and I gave it to her. And as I was reflecting on this uh, scripture, later it struck me, like you know, now she too is uh, was requiring that help for the kingdom, for the kingdom of God only, because she's a catechist. She needed it for mass. Um, I have the resource, but sharing it would mean I would have an inconvenience for a day, some time lost, and. Another thing that struck me was like I was offering it to her, not at that time. Like, you know, I was trying to uh, justify myself and making my own self feel good about the fact that, okay, I'm just denying it one time. But in the future, if you should need it, then I will give it to you. So um, this is, this is uh, what convicted me. Uh, and uh, then allowed me to do good. So the word of God says in 1 John 3, 18, little children, let us love, not in not in word or speech, but in truth and action. So when, when, when we, we've just seen love does no wrong to a neighbor. Now, in this situation, the experience that I had, this catechist, was my neighbor. And when I denied it to her at first, I was actually doing her wrong. I would have done her wrong had I not changed my mind because when I don't give it to her and she has no other resource, she would have probably had to take a leave the following day because her uh, the mass was on the very next day. So she would have to take her off the next day so maybe if she has not taken permission, we do not know. So there would have been so much of uh, like, you know, trouble that she would have had to go to, through. There would have been so much of stress for her. And here I, I would have been like, you know, content saying that uh, I have already offered her for future. So it's okay. So when, when, when the Lord tells us that love does no wrong to a neighbor, these people who come in our lives, to whom we get an opportunity to, to allow God to serve, we cannot, we cannot uh, you know, overlook it. We cannot just brush aside because this laptop that I have, you know, it really led me into deeper and deeper thinking. Now, just about maybe a year and a half back, I never had a laptop. I didn't have a personal laptop. I had one which had got spoiled. But then after that, I didn't have a laptop. Since I was working, I always had an official laptop. But a personal one, I did not have. Now, as I started taking classes, the Lord made it possible for me to, uh, you know, have a personal uh, laptop which I could use only for the kingdom work. So this laptop that is given to me is a resource that God has given to me. It is it is not mine. It is his goodness that he has made it available for me. And when, when God has put resources in my life, now these resources are not exclusively for me. God has blessed me so that I in turn can become a blessing to somebody else. And that blessing was purely for kingdom work only. But can you see how momentarily uh, my heart was hardened because I was only putting myself, me first, and me in everything. So when, when um, I was reflecting on it, I was just beginning to understand in, in more, uh, like, you know, in a much better way, in a practical way, that just the way God has blessed me, now 
this blessing came to me when my husband saw that I wanted to take classes and I was operating only on a mobile and it was becomes difficult to navigate through scriptures because the mobile screen is very small. So he he gave this laptop to me. But when when the time came for me to uh, like you know share it, I had I had a little question. What about the delay? What about the time that I use? Now, God wanted to serve that catechist through me that day. And at first I declined. So my dear brothers and sisters, just ponder over this example. So it's, it's a small instance, but for me, it has been an instance of great learning. And when I say great learning, it is a, it has been an instance of great correction because when now with with that experience you know if i know that this is not going to be the last time this has indeed been the first time and there will be uh, instances in the future today it may be a laptop tomorrow it may be something else maybe someone needs to use the the, the vehicle for, for some time someone needs something else Am I going to be sensitive and am I going to be, uh, you know, uh, understanding that today the Lord wants to serve somebody else through me? Because we need to understand that we are all his stewards. And when we understand that we are all his stewards, he is using us to serve others because he himself did not come to be served. He came so that he could serve. And, and the same thing is expected of us. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So, um, sister, can we uh, go to 1 John 4, 12? No one has ever seen God. If we love one another... God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So we we know that uh, even though we have not seen God, we, we know that if we love one another, God lives in us. This is what um, we see uh, in the scripture. So that means when I love another, God is living in me and his love is perfected in me. And when, when I say I love another and I have the world's goods and I do not give it to a brother or sister who's in me, then how can I really say that God's love abide in me? Then I am not, I am not in a position to say that God lives in me. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, we, we also see uh, this very beautifully uh, addressed in Proverbs chapter 3. Thank you, Jesus. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 27 and 28. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come again. Tomorrow I will give it when you have, have it with you. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So we see Proverbs uh, 3.27. The word tells us, do not withhold to whom it, it is due. Now, many a times we can have this question, how do I know to whom it is due? Maybe it is not due to this person who is asking me. But remember, we saw in Acts 10, uh, 10, 38, Jesus who was anointed with Holy Spirit and power, he went about doing good to all. So when it says that to whom it is due, it is due to everyone who is in a need is in a situation of uh, a need. It, it can happen that, you know, maybe there are people in this world 
who are uh, very well off, they are very much blessed. They don't have any lack in terms of wealth, in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of their health is good. Uh, they don't have any dues. So, like, maybe they have never borrowed from any person or any bank or even an institution. They may have never fallen sick and uh, may have not taken help or uh, never received anything in cash or kind from anyone. So is it possible that in those circumstances that people can think that I have never owed anyone anything. So I am not supposed to give to anybody else. I am not, uh, I don't owe it to anyone. Can this kind of a situation arise? That I, since I've not borrowed from anyone, I'm also not required to give it to others. Yes. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So, so when, when it's very important for us to understand over here that even though I may not have a legal debt for, towards anyone, you know, I may not be indebted to anyone in terms of legally, but we all need to understand that according to the word of God, according to the gospel, we owe to everyone to whom it is due. And, and that is why the word here tells us, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due. We need to understand this word to whom it is due. My dear brothers and sisters, God has planted these resources in our life. It's not because, uh, you know, it's not that we have, it's not ours. It, it doesn't belong to us. We've not created those resources. But God in his mercy, he's been very gracious to us. God has been very, very gracious to us. And that is why he has given it to us. And, and when it is given to us, now the Lord expects us you know, to be, to be generous, to look for opportunities by which we can become a blessing to another. Like how Proverbs 3.28 says, do not say to your neighbor, go and come again tomorrow. I actually did this. I told her next time when you want, you come. This time I cannot give. So what was I doing? I was deferring. So it, it's like, you know, you just procrastinate it. You push it to another day. And, and then you justify. But the Lord is saying that, you know, when you have it with you, don't defer it. Don't, don't make a person uh, come again. And oftentimes we see this, you know, maybe there are people who have the resources and someone comes asking in times of need. It may be really a dire situation. But sometimes, you know, we can get uh, like, you know, a little bit of pride in us. Maybe sometimes, like, okay, you just come. Uh, let me, uh, let me take my time. Uh, I will think about it. And you come tomorrow, I will think about it and I will keep. But the Lord here is, the word of God is clearly telling us that do not say to your neighbor, go and come again tomorrow. I will give it. When you have it with you, see, when you do not have it with you, that's a completely different thing. But it is within your means. It is very much available with you. It is very much possible for you. Then the Lord expects us that we do not make that person go and come again. Because you never know. That person may be there with a very uh, simple need. But that need, what the other person has, may be not, not, nothing much to you. But it can mean the world for that person at that point in time. It can be a situation that that day, if it is not honored, maybe even someone can lose their life. Supposing if someone urgently needs to go to, uh, to the hospital and someone comes asking for a vehicle or or to be driven and we say, no, today I can't come, you come tomorrow, that person may lose their life. So that is that is what we see here, that the Lord expects us that 
we don't defer it when it is within our means to do it to do it then and there and there itself so sister can we go to uh, luke luke 10 the parable of the good samaritan so we can go directly to the parable or uh, luke 10 30 Jesus, yes. Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, bit him, and beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So, likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Praise God. Sister, can you just go to Luke 10, 33? Okay, so here I do not want to dwell much upon the priest who went by, the Levite who went by. Let us come directly to Luke 10, 33. And it speaks about um, uh, a Samaritan who was traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. So, was the was the injured man in a position to ask for help? No. So could the Samaritan have said to himself, he never asked me to help, why should I go? Yes, he could have. Do we find ourselves many a times in this kind of situation that we know that somebody is in dire need, somebody probably is on a deathbed, someone... Why just sickness? We we probably as are aware that there is a child whose school fees are not paid and the child is likely to be thrown out of the school because the parents are unable to pay for the fees. There may be a child who is weak in a particular subject but the parents cannot afford to send the child for extra coaching. We are aware. But because no, nobody has asked us, is it possible that we just move on Yes, because just, like we live in this world where uh, they say don't get involved in others matter. You just go ahead like. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. But we see, see this Samaritan, even though nobody asked him, yet what he, when he sees, he was moved with pity. Do we see this as a, a, a attitude or an attribute? that Jesus himself has had when he lived in the flesh on planet Earth? Was Jesus always moved with pity when he saw people who were suffering, when he saw the, the, the child, uh, the only child of the widow uh, dead, when he saw that the people were hungry for three days, didn't have anything to eat? Was Jesus always moved with pity? Yes. So was it only when he was asked upon or was it when he himself was aware? He, him, he himself was aware. So when, when he himself would be aware, being aware of what is happening around him because he was sensitive. He was sensitive to people, their needs. So he Jesus was always moved with compassion. And we see this Samaritan was also moved with compassion. So being moved with compassion of, of, of PT would be, you know, where a person is, is considering the well-being of another person. In this situation, could the Samaritan have given thought to, uh, if I help him, what will I get? Yes. Could he have given a thought to it? Because he did not even, he did not even know this person. He is not even of the same community. 
and he he was so badly wounded that he couldn't even ask or pledge anything in return and yet he was sensitive because he valued life he valued him as a person and when god had blessed him with the means because he had his he had his own animal with him uh, which could be used to transport this wounded person he had money with him which he could offer to the innkeeper to take care of him he did what was within his means so this samaritan was moved with compassion and when a person is moved with compassion now this is a form of love wherein you always look at the well-being of another in compassion it's it's never about what is going to be my benefit it's purely what needs to be done at a given time for another person who may be in a distress who may be suffering who may be in a situation of want praise god thank you jesus so so we see here that he does not only attend to him himself but he also takes him he puts him in the inn and also makes sure that he pays in advance for any expenses that would be incurred upon him and also he he promises to pay anything additional that is required when he returns not going into the details of that but but we see here that imagine imagine a situation that uh, he would have thought um okay i am also in a hurry maybe the person who comes after me may attend to him and uh, nobody comes by or no, even if somebody comes by and nobody attends could it have cost him his life could that person have probably died out of bleeding yes he would have so, died so is timely help reaching out and helping others in a timely manner uh, very uh, crucial yes very important yes so and and when i look at it maybe my example was not that of a life and death my scenario wherein i learned my lesson where the holy spirit has taught me may have not been a situation of life and death but what i had denied her would have surely cost her cost her meaning it would have led to stress it would have led to certain discussions with her boss wherein she would be probably forced to take an uninformed leave so many things could have gone wrong at her workplace in the same way this man if he was not attended by the good samaritan maybe he could have like you know that due to bleeding it could have proved fatal so when good needs to be done we need to also understand that we need to do it in a timely manner not just keep deferring i'll do it today maybe i have the means i have the resources i have the resources so much of resources are available with me that probably i can fund on a child and often a often girl child somebody who is very talented in a field of sports but don't have the resources i am able to do it but i just keep on pushing it maybe at another day uh, why only now i will look at it later so so what am i doing god has actually planted all the resources that were required for that other person into your household believing that you will move with compassion but when i or or when we we allow our heart to be hardened when we think oh giving certain part of my resource to another maybe at some point in time i may fall short so let me be fully secure let me be fully aware that there is not going to be any shortfall and then i will calculate and see how much i can give maybe by that point in time the child would have already lost that opportunity that opportunity may may no longer be there so god has blessed us so much and and you know it's it's said that this world has enough for everyone's need but not for our greed 
we are somehow day by day becoming a very greedy generation. We are becoming a generation whereby we are just accumulating and accumulating, thinking that it will come in handy for me on a rainy day. Can we choose to trust in the Lord? Can we choose to trust in the Lord and know that my God supplies all my needs? When we were taught the prayer of the Our Father, give us this day our daily bread. Are we choosing to believe that it is the Lord who provides all my needs? And if I believe that it is the Lord who provides all my needs, then will I be actually bothered to only sit and accumulate? You know, this, this un, um, or the, the desire or the insecurity to keep on accumulating is a measure of our distrust in God. That means we don't believe that God is our source. We believe that we are our own source. We are our own providers. But beautifully in um, in Matthew 6, sister, can we go to Matthew 6, 33? But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Praise God. See, a man's basic need is food, clothing, shelter. In, in Matthew chapter 6, starting 25 onwards, the Lord is speaking about how the birds are fed. They don't feel in barns, but yet they are fed. How the lilies of the field, how they are... Uh, arrayed in beautiful clothes. So when when um, the birds, the flowers, the, the grass of the field is taken care of, the, the food, the clothing, the shelter is all taken care of. God has promised us that when you seek, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he has promised us everything. So why live in this insecurity that I need to hold, not just hold for me or my children, maybe for generations? Do we think that the generations that will come will not be capable enough to uh, provide for themselves with the grace of God? Do we, do we think that I need to accumulate it all for them and they will be only sitting and consuming all that is being accumulated by the great, great, great grandparents. Why do we want to live in this insecurity about the generations to come? Just the way God has given you the grace, God has blessed you to accumulate well, because it is the Lord who blesses us. He is the one who equips us to accumulate well. The same way our generations also will have the blessing. So why, why not look at the person who's around me, who's in me? Now, many a times there can be a question, okay, that means we should work, we should earn, and then provide for the whole world, and they can simply idle around. Uh, we can go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10. Thank you, Jesus. Or even when we were with you, we gave you this command. Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. Praise God. So, so there are times, you know, where uh, certain people, they don't want to work. So they'll give excuses after excuses. They'll say they don't have a job. They can't find a job. But in their heart and in their mind, they know that they don't want to put an effort to search for a job because they know somebody or the other is going to have pity on them. Somebody or the other will provide for their needs because they can see that they are jobless. Now, when God is expecting us to do good to the neighbor, it is not that we are expected to good, do good and provide the needs of those people who are unwilling to work. 
anyone unwilling to work should not eat. If we see further into Thessalonians 3, 11, we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busy bodies, not doing any work. They are busy doing what God alone knows. So for those who want to remain idle, it's not expected that others will show kindness and feed you. This is the goodness has to be meted to those to whom it is due. It is possible that someone is unable to work because of the physical uh, disability for a sickness that has struck for a given period of time, the person is unable to work. It is possible that uh, a young woman uh, with many children has lost her husband and she hasn't been working. So there is a point in time that she needs to, you know, look after the family. So these are the situation and circumstances wherein we are called, we are called to be able to, uh, you know, reach out because they genuinely need help. But someone who doesn't want to work and is expecting, you know, we I see this, uh, this, um, situation many a times you know if there are many children in the in the family so maybe there is one particular child who is who is pampered and everybody all the other sibling sorry sorry about that Please God. So there may be the one child or maybe a brother who is taking care of everything in the house, but he's not working. And uh, this sister, that brother, they are providing for them. And in all of this, what is happening is the person is not at all inclined to work. And this is actually very bad. We need to understand that that person has to be working. That person is capable. But if everybody is going to provide for him, he will never recognize the need to work. He will never understand the dignity of labor. So we need to be mindful. You know, us loving somebody, that love should not be to spoil the person. That love has to be to build up the person, to encourage the person, to uplift the person, to edify the person not to spoil the person that, you know, uh, that that person lives just to be um, living in idleness. And when, when there is idleness, we know an idle mind is a devil's workshop. If that person has got nothing to do, all his needs are met, his or her needs are met, he's going to, the enemy is surely going to use him in things which are not of the kingdom of heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. So, so we are called, we are called to be um, helping one another, supporting one another, and especially the word of the word of God tells us in Galatians chapter 6, verses 10. Thank you, Jesus. Sister, can I take your 10 minutes more? Praise yes, God. yes, yes. Yeah. Just 10 minutes. Praise God. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. Praise God. So let us look at the scripture closely. It speaks of when there is an opportunity, let us work for the good. Now, this good is the good of all. But there is again a special mention to the family of faith. Now we are all one family of the faith. And when we are all one family of the faith, let us consider reaching out. It, it just doesn't mean that my family means my uh, like no, husband, wife, brother, sister. No, it is talking of the family of the faith. We who are one body in Christ the church, let us give consideration. Does not mean that we should not do good to others who are in need. But whilst we do good to all, 
we need to give a special consideration to the family of the faith. And, and uh, oftentimes, you know, uh, we work a lot to excel in, in various areas, like in, in building our faith, in, in our uh, uh, increasing our knowledge, uh, as, as 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 says that. Uh, sister, can you go there? Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. Praise God. So, so when it is talking about generous undertaking, it is talking about generous giving. We are here... We are here because we want to grow in the understanding of the word of God. These, these teachings and many other things that we do, praying together as a family, having community uh, fellowship, uh, going to church, celebrating the Holy Eucharist um, and uh, various other activities to build our spirituality, spending our alone time with the word. All this is good and we are, uh, you know, we want to excel here in everything, in building up faith, in speech and knowledge, in, in, in uh, you know, uh, in our uh, love work. But the word of God says here, it says, so we, uh, uh, when, when St. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. In certain translation, it says in generous giving. Giving is such, such a beautiful um, act. Uh, the, the word of God says that believers are lenders and not borrowers. Let us always want to be in a position of being able to give. It's very pitiable if we have to be in that position of receiving. None of us should hope to be, uh, you know, uh, being left to be at somebody else's mercy. If we can do it, very nice. But let us understand that the word of God says that we are lenders and not borrowers and finally the i like to go to this last scripture G, uh, psalms 37 verses 4 verses 3 thank you jesus 3 trust the lord and do good so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Praise God. So, so many of us may be reading the Psalm 37. I know it is a favorite among many people. And especially then when it comes to uh, Psalms 37, for take delight, delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. But how about being able to trust in the Lord? When a person trusts in the Lord, that is when the person is actually enabled to do good. Because it says, trust in the Lord and do good. So doing good includes giving. It's sometimes, you know, we, you see many people, they'll be, very, uh, they'll be very good with their words. They'll sympathize. They'll try to empathize. They'll listen to you for hours. But when it comes to giving, when it comes to action, words are good. But the word of God tells us faith without actions is dead. If we don't act, if we do not do good, if we don't give, that means it's a question, do we really trust in the Lord? Because the Lord says, trust in the Lord and do good. Why? Why? So you will live in the land and enjoy security. Your security is assured when you trust in the Lord. And when you are trusting in the Lord, you are enabled to do good. But many times we may find ourselves, you know, looking at it partly, looking at it in portion. Okay, I trust God. 
But what about doing good? No, no, no. What if it falls? What if it is going to be short for me? I'm not too sure I have excess. My dear brothers and sisters, doing good is never a measure of parting away with what excess you have. If that doing good doesn't pinch you, if it doesn't pinch you, if it doesn't move you, it's not really a good that is done to the tune that God has blessed you to do. If giving that laptop hadn't to pinch me, of course it did because I lost one, one evening work uh, on making my notes. But, you know, the, the peace that I had, the joy that I had, that I could make a small difference in somebody else's life, that was, that's beyond measure. I was really filled with the joy of the Lord. So that's all I had to say today. I request you, my dear brothers and sisters. I think Sister Isabel had raised her hand. Sister, if you have a question, then you can ask. Anybody, if you have any doubts, any clarification? Any questions? Sisters, sister. No, I don't. I don't know. Please go. Okay. I don't know if anybody has a question, uh, but I am really rejoicing on this topic today because I don't know whether Sister Simitra knows uh, the motto of our congregation is do good where there is good to be done. Even yes. though you have said good, good to whom it is to be done, to, to whom it is due. Our founders say, do good where there is good to be done. And our Pacific members today might have got, uh, really got uh, the richness of the word of God of doing good. They do a lot of good. Really, they do a lot of good. And Please. today I see that most of the Pacific members were around 40 members were there today on the panel. And they, they might, uh, they, I know that they have received the word of God, how to do good. So I, uh, I believe our uh, Pacific members have understood how to be doers of the word of God, to do good. When Father Bairam and Mother Clara said, do good where there is good to be done. And I thank uh, Sister Sumitra for giving us this opportunity to understand the word of God, how we are called to do good. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Uh, Sister Fedora, would you like to add something, Sister? No, sister, it was really a beautiful topic. I was also learning. Like, this topic is like, it's so relevant in our day-to-day, -day, small, small little things because we, we are surrounded by people, surrounded by students who need help. Are we sensitive to, you know, are we compassionate to them? Or do we just go about achieving our own goals, our own dreams, our own ambitions in life? So this is really beautiful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, sister. Praise God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Uh, so if we don't have any any further questions, uh, then I request the sister who is supposed to... Hello, sister. Yes, yes, Sister Isabel, I think you raised your hand. Sometime. Yes, I would like to add to what Sister Piedad said. Do good where good is to be done. I used to always wonder why she used to say, do good where good is to be done. So over there, like there was a big question mark for me always till today. But after explanation today, I understood that do good where good is to be done. That is all the time for all at all times. Thank you so much for explanation. Praise God. Beautiful. Thank you, Jesus. 
so i request uh, thank you sister isabel i request uh, sister uh, who's supposed to say the thanksgiving prayer can you please go ahead lord we thank you that you have revealed your love to us today we are convinced that you sent us out from here in the power of the holy spirit may what we have learned through your word, the thoughts we have shared dwell in our hearts and stir us to action. It was a very inspirational and motivational session that has enlightened our minds. I thank Sister Sumitra for this very valuable and interesting session brought before us. Thank you very much and good night to one another. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Glory be the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. I thank all the FASFIC members for joining us today. And we'll meet again next one. Thank you, Jesus. Have a blessed night. Thank, thank you, Jesus. Bye, thank sisters. You. Thank you, Praise God. Thank, thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, sisters.